So I'm really excited to get to share a little bit about Climate Trace with you today. I thought I'd start with a video that just gives a quick overview of what we're working on. Right, but we don't really know. Up until today, we've had to rely on vague, high-level estimates that often come from the polluters themselves. And that information is often years out of date and almost always full of gaps and omissions. It's not data you can act on. That's why we're building Climate Trace. Our ultimate goal, to create a comprehensive, highly detailed, up-to-date map of exactly where all global emissions are coming from and who is producing them. How does it work? We capture measurements from satellites and thousands of sensors based on land, in the sea, and in the sky. Data that's never been seen before. Climate Trace uses AI to verify the data, identify patterns, and provide new powerful insights. So decision makers will have all the information they need to make informed choices and reduce emissions. No more relying on self-reporting. No more waiting years to see if reductions are actually happening. And most importantly, no more hiding. We've already created a comprehensive inventory of emissions from every country with detailed emissions data from specific industries. Over time, we'll be able to monitor power plants, feedlots, airports, landfills, anything and everything that is creating the emissions that are driving the climate crisis. It's the ultimate tool to battle emissions. And it's being built by the leading experts in climate science and technology teaming up. We're bringing the best of today's technology to the fight. With Climate Trace, we're making the invisible visible. Join us. To learn more, go to climatetrace.org. So what does it mean when Al Gore says we don't really know what is causing climate change? That's quite a statement. Because we obviously know that what is causing climate change is greenhouse gas emissions, mostly from fossil fuels. But what we don't actually know is where those fossil fuels are being burned, who is burning them, what actually exactly happened to cause this. Because for decades, what scientists have been able to see is all the pollution in the atmosphere. But what we can't see is how did it get there. So we currently live today in a hyper-monitored world if the question is, are we in trouble? And if you're here, you know the answer is we are in serious, serious trouble. But knowing that there is a problem is really different than knowing exactly what caused the problem so you can do something about it. I mean, think about how many startups here are working on the quantified self. We really don't have an equivalent for the planet. I'll give you an example. The Paris Treaty, the landmark treaty in climate change, is fundamentally a transparency framework. The heart of it is the idea that countries, literally every country in the world has agreed to this, is going to measure their emissions and make them available to everyone else. However, in a lot of cases, that means 20-year-old data. What are you supposed to do with an estimate of what emissions were 20 years ago, many years before they signed the agreement? If you pass a policy, what are you supposed to do? Wait 20 years to find out if it worked? That's a very slow cycle. We also only have information like the total emissions from a country is such and such, or maybe we know this much comes from the energy sector and this much comes from everything else. The difference between that and being able to know this steel mill and this ship and this plane caused emissions yesterday is pretty dramatic. One of the most big changes we've been seeing as environmental groups over the last couple of years is as interest in climate change grows, we're seeing a new form of greenwashing. It's not just anymore that companies are pretending they're clean. What they're doing is they are actually really reducing their carbon footprint by just handing the polluting assets to other companies who don't care. And if our global state of the art in most countries and most sectors right now is we literally ask polluters how much they polluted, and then we add up those results, sometimes on paper, in a process that can take years, think about how easy it is to game that system. So we live in a world where we know something is wrong, but what we want to live in is a world where it's really easy to figure out exactly what has happened, who has done it, what would it take to make it easier, and think about the massive scientific and technical challenge we are talking about 
to monitor every sector of the economy, not at the level of countries, but at the level of individual ships and planes and factories. To do it not with a 20-year or two-year lag, but to get information like yesterday. And to do that in a way where there is no ability to hide. Oh, and if we actually are serious about this thing doing anything about climate change, everybody needs to trust it. So we need to have ways to be really sure it's right. And it actually cannot be for sale. It needs to be free for everyone, or we are going to live in a world where only the wealthy can afford to figure out what is going on in climate change. So this is too big a project for any one organization. That's why I'm not here pitching a startup or a company. I'm here describing a large coalition of organizations that have decided to come together to work on the same problem. So where exactly would you start with a problem like this? The first thing you might want to figure out is what are all the different ways you could measure emissions? So at Climate Trace, we have about 50 organizations working on different types of pollution. And for each one of those, we've looked at what would it take to figure out precisely what is going on with the emissions all around the world with the kind of signal you could get in real time globally. So one example is uh, satellites like the Gaofen 6 satellite from China look at visible light. And if you are looking at a power plant, you can see the steam coming out of the cooling towers. And that actually correlates pretty well with when the power plant is causing emissions. Satellites like NASA's Landsat 8 allow you to look at thermal infrared. Heat is a really good predictor of emissions. You also can use satellites like the European Union's uh, Tropomi network, which allows us to look at column integrated NOx, a co-pollutant that is only important here because usually when you see that, you are also seeing CO2. We also have the ability to do increasingly sophisticated things with AI, like detect ripples in lakes. Why is it important if a lake has the water rippling? Because if that is happening right next to the cooling intake valve of a power plant, which has to suck in enormous quantities of water in order to cool down, a really effective way to figure out if a power plant is polluting is to look at the water nearby if you can figure out exactly when and how it's drawing. So these are a whole bunch of hypotheses that we have gathered from many different organizations about how you could maybe spot pollution. Notice what is not on this list. It's pretty striking that in the top four list of ways to spot CO2, CO2 itself did not even make the list. One of the things that we've learned is that although there are satellites that can see CO2, there's so much of it in the atmosphere now, there's so much background pollution and there's so much weather moving it around, that just because you see CO2 near a power plant, not a particularly good indicator that that power plant actually caused those emissions. They could have blown over from a nearby city, they could have been there for a long time. So that's the kind of hypothesis testing that we've had to go through to figure out, okay, what do we think would be a good predictor of emissions? And what is really a good predictor of emissions? And how can we use as many of these signals as possible by as many of us as possible teaming up to figure out exactly what's going on? So an example of how we do that is a computer vision model. So what we will typically do is first gather all the satellite or other big data about a variety of assets like power plants, and then we will annotate them. So the red and blue boxes you're seeing are the cooling towers, which uh, energy experts have painfully manually gone through all the power plants in the world and drawn little boxes around where we would actually see that if emissions happen there or steam happens there, that will correlate very closely with that unit is on. Other experts have gone and measured from groups like the United States EPA, which happens to measure every hour the pollution at power plants, in a painfully constructed database, at the time that photograph was taken, which of those units were turned on and what were their emissions. So now we have a ground truth training data set, and we also have a signal that can be applied to any power plant in the world. So once we've annotated these and we've handled all the various problems like transliteration across languages, we've learned, for example, when you're transliterating from Chinese to English, there are about five different ways that five different entities will typically have translated to English the same name of the same power plant. So there's a massive, massive data quality problem that in the past had held up individual organizations from solving this problem. And the idea behind Climate Trace is each one of us is breaking off one piece of the puzzle. One person will specialize in ground truth data, one person will specialize in translation, one in annotation, and so on. So we get this big shared database, and we are able to try a variety of different computer vision models to say, of these two photos, how much emissions is happening at each unit at each time. 
So we try uh, patch gradient boosted trees and a variety of others, but convolutional neural networks are slightly leading the other techniques right now. So we have about 72 different models that we're using just for this one sector of the economy. And what we're able to do is we're able to predict in these two photos what were the emissions approximately of each unit at that timestamp, stitch that together for all of the times that any relevant satellite passes overhead, combining an ensemble model that uses all the various techniques, so we have cross-validation from different networks and different techniques, to get a pretty good estimate of what are the emissions of this power plant. Now here we're using a training test data split, so this is the technique where we knew the answer. Uh, and we trained the algorithm and we are able to produce the emissions of this estimate. What's much more interesting, oop, um, maybe I'll go out right here. What's much more interesting is what we are able to do when uh, we are applying this to power plants that have never been monitored. So many countries monitor their power plants every couple of years, they get an estimate. Some don't even do that. So here we are looking at a model before China opened up a little bit more emissions data recently. We were able to estimate by applying that model trained on American and other power plants, what uh, were the monthly emissions at every individual coal plant in the country and make that information transparent. So what we're doing is we are going to any sector, any country that happens to have done a really detailed job monitoring these things, any technique that any one of our many members can apply globally, and training models on the ones that have more transparency, and then applying them globally to get these estimates in every sector. And as you saw me um, get my slides out of order here, um, we are then doing this in different sectors of the economy. So just a couple of examples. Uh, Global Plastics Watch and Earthrise Media are collaborating on a technique to detect landfills from space. This is interesting because we've learned that there are far more landfills in the world than were previously believed. So until this project, it was believed that trash was a relatively small driver of climate change. We now know it's been underestimated by probably about a factor of three, and we think this was not a case of countries deliberately falsifying data. We think this is a case of who's paying attention to how many landfills there are. But knowing the amount of methane coming globally allows us to have a much more accurate picture of what's actually driving climate change. Another example, Transition Zero is able to look at very high temperatures in cement and steel kilns and get a sense based on a good understanding of those chemical processes at the time the satellite passes overhead, what are the emissions of those particular facilities? Um, the University of Malaysia has done really interesting work getting far more up-to-date counts of all the rice fields in the world and the methane emissions associated with that. We've also discovered that there is probably a lot more methane emissions from rice than had previously been believed. Um, and then groups like Ocean Mind are using other techniques such as radar. The automated information system is a technique that every major ship worldwide uses to not crash into each other. So they're constantly broadcasting their location. And so they can back out from this, what is the speed and location of every major vessel in the world? And it turns out there's a surprisingly tight correlation between speed and emissions. The emissions of a ship rises with the cube of the speed. So knowing how fast that thing is going is massively important for figuring out how much is it actually polluting. So all of these are sort of mini coalitions in themselves. And what Climate Trace has done is bring so many of these together into a single database. Um, and so what we are doing then is aggregating those up and making them available to the public free. Something like Wikipedia, but with a lot more sensors. So we've been able to pick, I don't know, this is last year's release um, for the aluminum sector. I would not have known this, but the United Arab Emirates turns out to be the third largest aluminum polluter in the world. And exposing this kind of information for every sector in every country has been incredibly useful for climate negotiators. And the next step is going from that to individual facilities. So one of the things that people typically see when they hear about this project is like, great, we're going to catch the bad guys. And that's true. Uh, I am excited that uh, for any company worldwide that thinks it can continue hiding its emissions, it has about 13 months at best until those facilities are going to be exposed to the general public. Um, I'm also excited about how when we tried to expose the illegal polluters on countries, we had some unexpectedly good results. One of the things we learned is that the countries that are parties to the Paris Agreement, which is essentially all of them, had been much more honest with each other than their climate negotiators believed. So what we were told by many climate negotiators is the reason our country is not lowering emissions is we think the other countries are lying. And everybody had their own theories about who is falsifying what data. And there's a couple of cases where we found a little bit of falsification. 
But one of the big surprises here is it looks like the whole Paris Agreement, many, 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 many countries have been more honest than their partners across the table thought they were being, and we are already in better shape than we thought on climate change. When's the last time you heard, we are already in better shape than we thought on climate change? Because it turns out, actually, everyone was negotiating in good faith. And so this already has been incredibly valuable for climate negotiators to hear, hang on, if actually there's more trust in this room than we thought, maybe we can stretch a little harder. Maybe we can all go a little bigger on the next round of climate negotiations. So I'm really excited about that part. But the last part, and why I'm here at Collision Conference, is the third and most exciting piece of all of this. I'm sure everyone here at a tech event is well aware that once you can actually monitor something in great detail, you can make a plan to do something about it. So we're a coalition of universities, scientists. We are really, really good at solving the problem of what is going on. We are not entrepreneurs. So what we are really interested in is we've found a variety of techniques where once you have better data, you can have new scalable business models, new forms of policy that can reduce emissions more quickly. But we think we've only scratched the surface of what's possible. So I'll just give you a couple examples, and I am really interested in what have we not thought of yet. So one example is it turns out when you know exactly how much pollution a power plant is putting out every hour, you can also calculate how much money it's making. And that's pretty interesting because it turns out we've been able to figure out 45% of all coal plants in the world are making so little money, it would actually be cheaper just to shut them down and start over with renewable energy. But the vast majority of them have been hiding this from their investors. So we have been working with a number of banks to say, okay, this coal plant, this coal plant, and this coal plant, we're losing money in these periods, and if they tell you 20-year plans of how they're profitable, you should be very, very skeptical. This has been extremely interesting to investors, and this is one of the few examples we've been able to think of. Another one we've been able to think of, if you look at the hourly emissions of a grid, the state of California was investing heavily in batteries, and it turned out that batteries were not as green as we thought because the times that the batteries were charging is when it was profitable to charge batteries. They were only looking at the price of electricity. Nobody was looking at the environmental consequences. And so the state of California adjusted a program called SCHIP, which basically requires battery companies to take a look at the environmental data, what are the times the grid is clean and dirty, and do a little bit of shifting to when there's surplus renewable energy instead of when there's surplus coal power. This is pretty cool because it's one of the few government programs I've ever seen that in six months reduced emissions in an entire sector by 100%. It was a software plugin, didn't really cost anybody any money, 100% reduction in emissions. We are seeing more and more examples of this, but we are not experts in businesses. So my plea was everybody here who is excited to start companies, everybody here who thinks about policy, we are about to open up the world's most transparent detailed data set on what is causing climate change. It's got metadata, it's got transparency, you can see the whole thing, it's all open source and free. My plea to you is to take a look and see what your next business could be, reducing emissions now that we actually figure out what's causing them. And we're not allowed to make money on this, but you are. So good luck, and um, I hope you guys can solve climate change. Thank you.